Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokus Mystery. This will be part 375. We're continuing with our lesson titled Luciferian Breakdown. This will be part two. We're examining the tactics of the intelligences that keep the human race in bondage. who they are and how they operate. Scripture teaches the human race is in captivity to races of Luciferian intelligences. The most destructive of these intelligences are the serpent races under Satan. Genesis 3 verse 15. And I'll put enmity, antagonism, variance, strife, between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So what this is saying, basically, is there's going to arise conflict between the race of the Prototokos, ultimately, and the race of the serpent intelligences the ultimate outcome will be their defeat mm. now since this is Elohim speaking through YHVH mm -hmm. the enemy understands that there's absolutely nothing that he can do about this curse spoken out against him mm -hmm. so I guess he just keeps quiet uh, no he's devising a way out of it from the beginning when uh, this is spoken, he realizes it's a challenge, and he understands more than the humans. This basically is going to culminate at the end of time. Right. The end of the age. And all the beginning is a pre pre preparation to neutralize the human race through which the seed of the woman is going to come, keep it in bondage so that the prophecy cannot manifest. Hmm. You wipe out the seed of the woman, mm -hmm. you wipe out the victorious outcome of the conflict. Mm -hmm. So from the beginning, everybody left the garden. The humans were driven out, White's VH came out because he was now custodian over them, and the serpent came out. So this plan that um, Satan has in his mind is perfect. Sure. He will be an overcomer, is, is, is how he's looking at things. Exactly. He has been successful. Uh, you look at the condition of the human race. The human race has been destroyed. The human race has a death sentence hanging over it. Judgment. Mm -hmm. Which has the, the, the serpents under Lucifer wringing their hands in glee. But what they don't understand is that Elohim circumvents all of this in Christ. They're successful in killing what they conceive to be the main threat, the human race. Mm -hmm. But what they don't comprehend is the ability of Elohim to bring life back from death right. in Christ. <clears throat> so we see the enemy are the serpent races, and you have others in the periphery, the principalities in the heavens, the... Um, nations all of them have a part in keeping the human race down because they understand that the human race is a threat to all of them mm. so it occurs to me based on what you've just said the human race is a threat to all of them but had the enemy understood that the lord wished to die so that humanity could be reconciled with the father they wouldn't have gone that route would they you quote first corinthians the second chapter had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And Jesus told them what was happening, but they didn't understand it in comprehension because they didn't comprehend the plan of God. Sure. They thought killing him would solve the right. problem. Right. But let's go on. <clears throat> Scripture indicates many of these oppressors 
are highly advanced spirits that carry the names of earthly creatures. Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and, and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. So he singles out serpents and scorpions, <clears throat> um, elements of the serpent races, which is indicative of these are the advanced guard that have the human race under siege. Notice what he goes on to say. Verse 20. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits, that the spirits, that the spirits, so serpents and scorpions are spirits, spirit intelligences of the serpent races, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Which brings us to the next principle. Scripture indicates in the spiritual realm, the intelligence is there, both fallen and unfallen, have the ability to craft implements to carry out their activities. So they weld instruments, implements to enable them to function in their environment and the fallen intelligences use the implements to keep the human race in bondage in our reality. Are you including structures in this list? Mm-hmm. Okay. Some of the things that are mentioned are <clears throat> weapons, measuring devices, writing implements, uh, structures, as you say, we did a whole lesson on uh, the structure that they, that they uh, erect in the spiritual. We're going to take a look at some of the uh, <clears throat> descriptions. Isaiah 54, verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith, where smith there literally means craftsman, that bloweth the coals in the fire, and that bringeth forth an instrument for his work. And I've created the waster to destroy. So what we find, we get an insight into life in the higher realms. Similarity is similar to life here, where you have structure, you have things that are brought into being to enable the individual to do what he's been called to do. And in that respect, <clears throat> they uh, accomplish, particularly in the angelic realm, many things through the implements that the craftsmen have brought into being. You have chariots, swords, implements of war, you have structure, <clears throat> you have implements of um, construction, measuring devices, you have what's called a plum, which gives you the ability to gauge measurements. Angels are consistently seen measuring things. So there's consistent construction going on in the unseen realm, just as you have it in the visible realm. Is it fair to say that the 
implements used by the sons during the plague tribulation period are far superior in their effectiveness than these that we're talking about here used by the fallen angelic beings. The sons don't need instruments. Well, don't the sons give, well, the sons do give the angelic beings power over the world. The angelic point. beings use the implements. Okay, so you don't see the, God with the measuring rod. That's true. That's true. So would those implements that the unfallen angelic beings, excuse me, etc., would be far more effective than those used by the fallen beings? It's the same thing. Same implements. Okay, sir. This continuous, what seems to be the way you've explained it, the continuous construction things that are happening with the angels. Is it all directed by Elohim? No. No. The spirit in the individual enables him to do his job through what he needs to be constructed. God is engineered in such a way. He doesn't micromanage. Okay. He just delegates. He may say to um, just as on, on the earth where <clears throat> Widespread says, I have I have given Bezalel the spirit of craftsmanship right. to bring about what needs to be done to its perfection. So he goes about doing what he knows to be doing done by the spirit that's in him, directing him to do this to the state of perfection that is required. Everything is set in motion in such a way that it is self-manifesting, bringing about the result. The intelligence is controlling and being controlled and directed to do what he's been created to do to a state of perfection. So, are these individuals making independent choices? Yes. They're not controlled overall, just for example, by the Holy Spirit? No. Okay. Remember, there are many spirits. Sure. And each one has been created to do whatever it is, like you find, uh, turn to Zechariah. you see an example Zechariah uh, the first chapter Picking it up in, uh, let's see, verse 8. <clears throat> I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse, and he stood among the myrtle trees. Myrtle trees are evergreen trees. Okay. This is a spiritual vision that Zechariah has. This isn't on earth, this is in the heavens. <clears throat> and there were in the bottom behind him were, were there red horses speckled and white. Then I said, O oh my Lord, what are these? The angel that talked with me said unto me, I will show what these be. The man that stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are they whom the Lord had sent to walk to and fro through the earth. Now, what is being said here is these angels have been given a m m mission to go forth and to uh, <coughs> institute conditions. Go to chapter 2. 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked and behold a man with a measuring line in his hand. Where did he get the measuring line from? The smith that made it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> then said I, Whither goest thou? He said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. 
So he's not talking about physical Jerusalem. He's talking about spiritual Jerusalem in the what we, we would consider astral plane. astral plane. Because spiritual Jerusalem is going to be the precursor to things happening in the physical realm. You read about that in Zechariah in uh, Ezekiel. This is the same Jerusalem. Ezekiel is shown, and things are happening there, and the angels go and judge it because of the transgressions and stuff. Yes. So he's curious, so he wants to go measure it, or he's measuring it because he's been directed. Why is he going to do this measuring? Because of things that are going to happen in the future. So his foreknowledge gives him the impetus without somebody directing him to do it, he knows to do it. Yeah. Well, the Lord has sent him. The Lord tells him, go and measure Lord, Jerusalem. That's yeah. yeah. Go and measure Jerusalem. He goes and measure Jerusalem. The prophet asked him, where you're going? He says, I'm going to measure okay. Jerusalem. Because yeah. later on, the prophet, another prophet, is going to be taken to this Jerusalem and be given understanding of the, the conditions that are going to transpire and the results. You have Zechariah here, turn to Ezekiel, 8th chapter. Excuse me, Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. This is the Jerusalem that the angel went to measure. The Ezekiel is being shown as the results of what's going to happen in the future. Verse 1, He, YHVH, cried also in mine ears with a loud voice, saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near, even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Jerusalem is going to be under judgment. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. How did they get the slaughter weapon? The smith crafted it for them. <coughs> and one man among them was clothed with linen, with a rider's acorn by his side. Where did he get that? Smith crafted it for him. And they went in and stood bef beside the brazen altar. So they get their instructions. You know, we're going to go through judgment. It could have been one or two ways. They were there to bless the city, to protect it. Instead, Ezekiel is being shown in these previous chapters the, the, the detestation that brings upon a judgment. This is all in the spiritual realm. The angels are given instruction what to do. Instead of blessing it, now you're going to wipe it out because of what the people are doing. So what you have here is activity taking place in the spiritual realm that's going to affect activity in the physical realm. So back to the original point when you said the Father doesn't micromanage. Yes. We're seeing here YHVH doing the management within the remit of what the Father wants. He must know what the Father wants for the him to The be Father doing doesn't micromanage. He delegates authority. Right. So he tells Mike's VH, you have authority over the situation. Okay. Okay. You're going to make the decisions, gotcha. the judgment, everything gotcha. in that respect. Okay, let's go on. <clears throat> so we see activity in the spiritual realm, similar to activity in the physical realm. <coughs> what you're looking here at here is the lower secondary creation. It's similar to the physical creation. As you get to higher states of perfection, it becomes radically different. So just again to clarify, this astral plane area that we're referring to is in between the lower secondary creation heavens and the middle section of the secondary creation heavens. The middle section being? Middle section is Revelation, the 12th chapter. Right, okay. Under the star group. Right, okay. Yes. At this point. Okay. Yeah. So the Lord is telling him, I'm putting you in charge. You are now responsible for right. what's happening. Yes. yes. It's not just the authority, you have to make sure it gets done correctly. Right. Yes. 
Yes, exactly. So yeah. in essence, he's he's dictating what is going to happen. Well, he's given a range of authority, and in that range, he's free to make decisions. That's why he can make decisions that have a negative outcome. Well, that was the, my follow-on question to what he was saying. The in problem, the, yeah, the, in the Lord saying that, mm -hmm. the Lord isn't saying this is the outcome that I want. He's merely saying you're in charge of all of this, yes. and we're going to look and see what your out, what outcome you bring for. Do it wisely. Right, right. That's why he doesn't micromanage. Right. He gives you the ability to make the right decision. He holds you responsible for the decision that you make. It's up to you to apply wisdom in the decision that you're going to make. Mm. Because if you don't, the outcome is going to be on you. How does a spiritual being know that that is the way that the Father works? Intrinsically. Okay, so it's programmed yeah. into them. It's your. Right. <laughs> so they're created. And because, okay, so if they're expected, or he's expected to act in wisdom, does he not need the Holy Spirit? No. No. Remember, there's a spirit of wisdom as well. Revelation. Yes. <coughs> that, that aspect of the, well, see, I'm, see what you just said, I'm looking at that as an aspect of the Holy Spirit, but I'm understanding you to mean that a spirit of wisdom is either built in to loyal angelic beings or can be accessed by it. Yes. Which way should we Both. Be? Okay. Both. Satan has a spirit of wisdom. Okay. It's in him. That's what he's created. Right. He corrupted the wisdom right. that was in him. There's a spirit beyond the, the being that he can access also. Not the Holy Spirit, but a high spirit, a wisdom, right. that would enable that individual, that intelligence, to make the right decision. So that that you're referring to is not uh, an aspect, one of the uh, seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. This is an individual, non-corporeal spirit. Okay. Yes. You have a universe of spirits sure. from the creation that existed before this one. Is the implication that there are a multitude of spirits, each able to do something similar? Yeah, you have so, families of spirits, just like your family. So when it comes to the, the spirit of wisdom, we should understand that there are many spirits of wisdom. Levels. Levels, okay, there it is. Because right. if you're on the secondary creation level, you can't access the spirit that's behind sure. it. Yes. And, you know, and the other thing is, is you want to make sure that the wisdom that you're asking, that you're wanting, you're desiring, is God's wisdom and not earthly wisdom. Not like Solomon's, you know. So. Well, the, the, the earthly wisdom aspect is self limiting. Okay. Solomon cannot access. The spiritual wisdom, unless he asks for it. Right, without going through one. But he's given the ability to access earthly wisdom because he asked for it. Mm. Right. And in that respect, God does all things wisely. He gives you the ability to seek wisdom. You seek it, you're going to get it. Solomon writes a whole chapter about that. Right. The fool rejects wisdom. wisdom. And thinks he can make it on his own <laughs> intelligence. <laughs> yes. So how is that Solomon is writing a whole chapter on wisdom and then he doesn't seek it himself? Because he chose not to. Pride. Here's the king. I make the decisions. I have the wisdom. And uh, I choose not to go beyond where I'm at. What's interesting is see, he, he, he reiterates, he goes mm -hmm. on and on, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Okay, so now he's, he's retorting something that he can, he's the only one that can retort because nobody else has been given the wisdom that sure. he's been given. Okay, mm -hmm. so he's speaking to himself or to YHVH and why... That, that makes him think that he's wise because no one else can tell him anything. Yeah. And now at that point, wouldn't you call him a babbler? Well, you'd, 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 you'd call him unwise. Okay. Because if he had followed his own wisdom, that you read it, what he wrote in Proverbs, he would realize that earthly wisdom has a limit. Right. 
and you have to make a transition from the earthly to the spiritual. Is the implication that he doesn't know that there is the spiritual? Sure, he knows. Okay. Sure then he, he, then he, he's a babbler. He has to be a fool then. Yeah. If he knows. Yeah, he's right. Right. Right, right. And the enemy is there. When you reach a point, because when you read Ecclesiastes, you're looking at a man who does not have confidence. Okay. He's searching from a human perspective. And when you limit yourself to a human perspective, that opens the door to the enemy to come in and influence you. That's a great point, yes. Solomon fell into the, what we're talking about here. Sure. The snare of the enemy, but let's go on. So we're looking here about activities, weapons, uh, implements <coughs> that originate in the spiritual realm and can affect life in the physical realm <clears throat> which brings us to the next principle scripture teaches the oppressor spirit devises weapons to create destructive conditions to ensnare the victim they will divide because you have fallen smiths just like you have unfallen smiths that craft implements in the spiritual realm. You got two societies, right. one fallen, right. one unfallen. Right. We see the truth of that when um, the father is telling Satan, look at Job, you can't touch a hair on his head. So from that we gather that there are various pseudo structures that Satan implements to influence sure. Job and to, to destroy sure. him. He says, well, you got a hedge around him, I can't right. get to him. Right. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the oppressive spirit devises weapons to create destructive conditions to ensnare the victim. 2 Corinthians 2nd chapter verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. The word devices there literally means schemes. He will engineer devices in the spiritual realm to ensnare his victim in the physical realm. He will literally craft a device which will set up a condition in the physical realm in which the victim will walk right into it and become imprisoned by so it. So we're not talking about just strategies, but the very implements that we've been talking yes. about. Yes. Okay. yes. Second Timothy, second chapter, 24 to 26. Now this is talking about the individual who's walking free because he's using wisdom. How does he relate to his brother that's in bondage? And the servant of the Lord servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all, apt to teach, patient, mm -hmm. in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. What does this mean? Instructing those who oppose themselves. It means an individual that has succumbed to the darkness and is currently in a situation in which he believes that what he's doing is the right thing. Mm. But the wise servant sees the truth of his situation and he is directing him to make him aware of the truth of his situation. This is done in love, in patience, and not to browbeat, not to criticize, not to antagonize, but to instruct. Note what he goes on to say. If 
God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. What does that mean? That they may yield to consider what's being said. If they do, God will give them the ability to exit that trap that they're in. Notice what he goes on to say. And they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Wisdom applied will enable the individual to exit the snare that the enemy has enabled them to walk into. Re requiring an understanding that the snare is a construct, the person is a, the snare is a construct, and the thoughts that that person is having are not necessarily his own. Without that understanding, that person is not going to go too far. Are they? The ability of the individual mm. to consider what you are presenting to him, all he has to do is to consider it objectively. Right. If he considers it objectively, the Father, through the Spirit, will give him the understanding of how to exit that okay. You present this to a you are in a situation where this, 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 and this is happening. <clears throat> I'm advising that you would consider this, 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 and this. Because if you continue the way you're going, brother, right. it's not going to end well. Right. And then you consider what's being said objectively. Mm. Instead of a knee-jerk reaction, oh, you know what you're talking about, right. I got, I can handle this, I'm good, and, you know, don't bother me. Right, the usual, okay. Which is the foolish response. Right. The wise response is to consider what's being said objectively so you can evaluate, well, hey, just told me this. Maybe I should see whether what he's saying is right. <coughs> and when he considers that objectively, the Father instantaneously gives, because he's got the Spirit in him, gives him perception. In other words, he's allowing light to enter into the darkness mechanism that's keeping him trapped. He considers this and he says, you know, I didn't see it that way before. I'm going to apply what Chris told me, and it says he will exit that snare. Mm -hmm. So the evaluation is the key to, to this, the, willing, the willingness to evaluate. Willingness to consider. Objectively, yeah. what happens is when the snare is, when the person walks into the snare and, 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 and it falls on him, along with that is a programming to reject truth. Sure. And when you reject truth, you take the key that would free you and you swallow it and you remain trapped in the thing perpetually. Let's go on. Scripture teaches those who are totally committed to the Lord. I'm going to repeat that. Scripture teaches those who are totally committed to the Lord will never be ensnared by the Luciferians. I'm going to repeat that. Those who are totally committed to the Lord will never be ensnared by the Luciferians. Isaiah 54, verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee, the spiritual realm, shall prosper. Now you can see from the scripture it's never referring to a physical assault by anything on the physical plane. Because a weapon that's pointed against you does not prosper, it takes you out. Somebody points a gun at you, which is a weapon, a bullet flies through and your gun, a knife, a sword, or whatever. It's not referring to a physical implement. 
It's referring to something that's crafted in the spiritual realm that's designed to create a condition mm -hmm. in the physical in your life because you've been scoped out and your limitations, your vulnerabilities are now known to the serpent, the scorpion, whoever the spiritual spirit is. He's crafted a weapon, set of conditions in this life, and you've walked into the snare. Well, you won't walk into the snare if you're totally committed because the spirit is always going to give you an understanding. That's a snare. That's a trap. Don't go in that direction. It will never happen. Jesus never got snared into any trap whatsoever because he was always open to the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the scripture is telling us whatever weapon is crafted, it will not operate. It will not achieve what it's been designed to achieve because you are going to always be in a position in which its design will never come to pass in your life. <clears throat> no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. Notice what it goes on to say. In every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. What does that mean? It means when you are experiencing unjust assault because other people have been motivated to persecute you, you are ultimately at some point in time going to be in a position of judgment over that person. Sorry, in the Revelation. Wait, 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 wait. Before we go there, yes. Let's re let's finish this this paragraph. Go ahead. Okay. The weapon that formed against us a prosper. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt go down. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. So it's literally, he's telling us, we are bolstered. We are, we are overcomers, if indeed that's what we do. Instead of being caught in the snare, we're overcoming the snare by ignoring the snare. By being committed to the Lord. He fights the battle for us. Mm -hmm. He directs us. That's what we want to go to Revelation 3rd that's chapter. A, that's our heritage. Yes. Could we call that protection? Yes. <laughs> yes. Revelation 3rd chapter. Verse 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet. And to know that I have loved thee. He's going to make every enemy, everybody that has ever come against you, to acknowledge and comprehend who you are in him. Praise the Lord. And to be humbled before you. He says, come and worship before, not before his feet, before your feet. <laughs> That's the heritage of the saints. Amen.